Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Jonardan Ganeri and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about Patanjali's Yoga Shastra with Philip Maas, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of South Asian, Tibetan and Buddhist Studies at the University of Vienna. Hi, Philip. Hello. Thank you for coming on the podcast. We're going to be talking about, as I just said, the Yoga Shastra, which was supposedly written by someone in Patanjali. And this is basically the founding document of yoga as a philosophical movement. And you've actually worked quite a bit on the composition of this text, not only the original sutras, so these brief remarks that stand in need of commentary, but also the so-called bhashya or commentary that was written on the text. Can you say something about when this was written and how it was written? Yes, I can. As far as uh, there are information regarding uh, this, questions about authorship uh, in uh, pre-modern uh, Indian philosophy are always uh, very difficult uh, to answer. We don't know anything about biographical details uh, about Patanjali. And all we can say has to be reconstructed from the text itself. It's possible to say that Patanjali was a learned Brahmin who lived um, approximately in the 4th or 5th century. And he tried to compose a work of yoga in which a tradition that um, believes in the possibility of uh, gaining spiritual freedom, liberation from suffering by means of meditation within a Brahmanical context should be established. Our knowledge about when this text was composed uh, comes from the text itself, as I said, and uh, conclusions can be drawn from the fact that Patanjali refers to the theory of Vijnanavada, a Buddhist theory which was formulated by an author named Vasubandhu, who lived approximately between 320 and 400 AD. And Patanjali explicitly refers to the theories of, uh, of Vasubandhu. And uh, that means that uh, yeah, Patanjali has to be dated after him. And uh, we, we can see that the work that Patanjali composed was then uh, quickly uh, gaining prominence within the Indian intellectual world. And it was cited already in the 5th century by Bhattrahari in his own commentary on his Vakyapadiya, a work on the philosophy of grammar. So that's the period of time that we uh, can fix after Vasubandhu and before Bhattrahari, like that means in the 4th or 5th century of the Common Era. Okay. That's, not, that's not too bad, actually. It's a lot better than a lot of the texts that we're talking about in the series. And um, like I said, it's, it consists of short remarks, which then get a commentary or bhashya, and there's a tradition that these were written by different people, the short remarks, the sutras, written by Patanjali, and the bhasha or commentary written by Vyasa, supposedly. But you question this, I guess? I question this, yes, and uh, I think there are good reasons to question this from, from a number of perspectives. So the first um, reason to question is, is the work itself. There's text imminent evidence that the Patanjali Yoga Shastra was composed as a unified whole. We have a uh, colophon to its four chapters, which calls the work the Patanjali Yoga Shastra Sankhya Pravachana. That means the authoritative exposition of yoga, the mandatory explanation of Sankhya philosophy. So there is no mentioning of Vyasa or Veda Vyasa as the author of a separate uh, commentary. Moreover, it is the case that the so-called sutras are very closely integrated into the work. So there, these uh, sutras, uh, these this verbal uh, or nominal expressions, are frequently parts of longer sentences in the, in the Barsha part. Yeah, from, from this perspective, it's quite clear that we have a unified work. The Barsha does not make any sense at all without the Sutra. And what is uh, even more seriously, even the Sutra does not make sense without the Barsha. So we have pronouns referring to Barsha parts of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. This makes it clear that the, the, the Sutras were never meant to be a text on their own, actually. Should we infer from that then that the author was trying to pass off 
a single work that he wrote or compiled maybe from on partially on the basis of earlier materials that he was trying to deceive the reader into thinking that this was some kind of authoritative set of sutras with a basha? Or do you think this was just how they wrote at this period? They were in the habit of writing by means of brief sutra statements with basha commentary, so that's how he did it. Actually, uh, the second uh, would be the case. Uh, there are a number of uh, examples of, of similar works, especially uh, the Abhidharma Kosha and the Abhidharma Kosha Basha by Vasubandhu, to which I have already referred, is a very similar enterprise of somebody writing uh, a very condensed metrical work and then providing it with his own explanation. Moreover, the Vakapadiya by Batahari, which I also have mentioned, is a word consisting out of a very, very difficult uh, verse composition, plus then um, an auto-commentary by Batahari on this. So um, this way of, uh, of composing philosophical works is not as unusual as it may seem. Actually, I really like this because one of the things I'm always trying to convince people of is that commentaries can be philosophically interesting and original. And what could prove that better than someone who sits down to write an original work in the form of a kind of self-commentary commenting on their own works? Moving on then to the philosophical content of the Yoga Shastra, it's pretty obvious that there's a close relationship between this text and the Samkhya philosophical tradition, which has its own kind of founding document, which is Ishvara Krishna's Samkhya Karika. This is something we've already talked about in the podcast series. We, should we just infer that Ishvara Krishna is influencing this text by Patanjali? Or should we think that yoga and Samkhya philosophy are actually this long-running, intertwined kind of double uh, tradition? People sometimes think that the Samkhya part is the theory and the yoga part is the practical part of the philosophy. So is it really two texts that are emanating from the same tradition? Or is it more like Patanjali is reflecting on Ishvara Krishna? Patanjali does not show any awareness at all of the Sankhya Karakas by Ishvara Krishna. And Ishvara Krishna's Sankhya Karakas do not show any awareness of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. So the question you are asking is very difficult uh, to settle. The commentators on the Sankhya Karika, they see the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as one of their sources. They constantly refer to the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and see it as an authoritative work of uh, Sankhya philosophy. The problem with Sankhya and probably also yoga texts is that much of the literature uh, that may have existed once has been lost in the course of the transmission. So what we have are, are just uh, pieces of jigsaw puzzles and it's our difficult task to reconstruct um, the past uh, from this. So there are many open, open questions and the exact uh, relationship between uh, the Sankhya Karika and the Patanjali Yoga Shastra cannot be settled. But what is clear and what we can see from the pre-classical uh, literature is that uh, in um, ancient and pre-classical India and South Asia, there existed many, many schools, partly in uh, rival schools of Sankhya, which shared some basic ideas about the relationship of mind and matter, kind of ontological dualism was important for, for these uh, schools. Yeah, most of these uh, schools uh, uh, hardly left any traces, but two of these schools, apparently the one by Ishvara Krishna and the one by Patanjali, have been preserved to the present day, and this is uh, what we have now. So it's more like we have two independent works that are drawing on similar ideas, and especially this kind of dualist framework. Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. Now, regarding that dualist framework, uh, you, you just said that it's a dualism of mind versus matter, and that's what we associate with Samkhya philosophy is we have this distinction between Purusha and Prakriti, the consciousness or mind on the one hand and nature or matter. People translate these things in different ways. On the other hand, one thing that I guess might surprise someone coming to this yoga text, though, is that the so-called mental organ, the thing you actually are sort of using in everyday uh, applications of cognition, isn't identified with the mind. Does he have an argument for why those two things have to be distinguished? Yes, when I was uh, talking about the ontological dualism of pre-classical source, uh, sources, it was appropriate to talk about mind and matter. When it comes to classical Sankhya, and uh, especially to uh, Patanjali Yoga Shastra and the Sankhya Karakas, 
then it is the case that uh, the term consciousness that you used is much more appropriate. Because the idea is that um, the world we live in consists of two realms. The realm of matter, which is active, and uh, which consists uh, of yeah, e the outside world, as we can perceive it, but also all kinds of information that are dealt with in the mind belong to this realm of matter. And there's only a very, very tiny uh, space left for other entities, and that's consciousness. And there's the belief that consciousness can be explained as being caused by an unchanging entity, which is called Purusha, the subject, and that remains eternally identical with itself and not in reality involved with the matter. But due to the proximity of the mental organ and consciousness, consciousness wrongly identifies itself with the realm of matter. It takes uh, the content of consciousness, which is displayed to it, like, like in a mirror, as um, affecting itself. And this fundamental ontological error causes pain and suffering to the consciousness and the task of, uh, of the yogin and, uh, is to disidentify himself with the content, content that is uh, displayed uh, to him by means of the experience uh, in meditation of the ontological difference between mind and matter. Okay, let me see if I get this straight. Let's take an example. Let's take the listener who's listening to this interview. The listener is hearing us talk and hopefully thinking about what we're saying and understanding it. And what you're saying is that that can't be an act of pure consciousness or purusha because the whole point of purusha, of this pure consciousness, is that it's unchanging. Therefore, as the listener kind of processes what I'm saying right now, hearing one word after another, or looks around them while they're listening to this or so on, that's in a way all on the matter side rather than the mind side. This is a very different way of thinking about the mind-matter distinction than the one that would be familiar in, say, contemporary philosophy of mind in the English-speaking world. Is that right? Yes. It's, it's the case that every event of consciousness, according to yoga, has two aspects. A content aspect and a consciousness aspect. And what remains identical in all the different kinds of experience, whether one is dreaming, whether one is listening, whether one experiences pleasure or pain, this is the element of consciousness. And all the other things that I've been talking about is uh, the element of content. This contradicts a little bit our experience, according to which mental events are of unified uh, nature. But this unified nature that we experience is indeed the fundamental ontological error that, according to yoga, has to be removed. Yeah? That, that's uh, avidya, that's a misconception ab about the world, yeah? taking the content as consciousness. Something else it says in the Yoga Shastra, as you mentioned before, is that the yogin who's trying to make progress towards this liberation is supposed to learn to meditate, learn to control their breath, and so on. And I'm wondering why that would be necessary. I mean, what you just said sounds like a pretty straightforward philosophical claim. And if you could give me arguments that persuaded me that it was true, it seems like I could know that that was the case and that should be enough. Why do I have to engage, if I'm a yogin that is, why do I have to engage in all of these other practices, for example, meditation that we associate with yoga? Uh, if, if what I said would make sense to you and you would understand it and you would be convinced of what I uh, just said, that would make you start a spiritual career. You would maybe leave your home um, and your family and start to become an ascetic, a yogi, in order to make uh, the experience in meditation of the fundamental difference between mind and matter. It's not enough uh, just... Uh, to have a rational thought about things, to understand them intellectually, but uh, the difference between mind and matter has to be experienced in what could be called a mystical experience, an experience which is believed to change the whole attitude that you have uh, to the world and the whole entanglement of your, of your purusha, of your inner subject with the world. 
which would make you uh, live for a little while in this world, but after your physical death, your, uh, your eternal subject would then withdraw from the realm of matter and would stay forever in isolation, in Kaivalya, in liberation. So it's not enough just to understand uh, the philosophical content of yoga, but it's very, very important to make the experience, the direct experience uh, of the ontological difference in deep meditation and to provide uh, a way into this direction, uh, the, the praxis of yoga is necessary. Okay, but I still have a problem with the idea of making progress towards this path because it seems to me like either I'm making the mistake of confusing consciousness with the content of consciousness, which is, I think, a very helpful way that you explain the problem that we've got. Either I'm making that mistake or I'm not. And I suppose I might be making it some of the time, right? Like I might maybe get distracted by seeing something and suddenly become kind of caught up with the content of my awareness rather than uh, identifying myself with my consciousness. But does he have an account of how there could be stages along the way towards this ultimate goal as opposed to just having, kind of having a flickering uh, in and out identification of the self with consciousness? Patanjali Yoga Shastra starts with a definition of what yoga is. And this definition in Sanskrit is yoga samadhi. That means yoga is concentration. And then the Patanjali Yoga Shastra enumerates different stages uh, in, in, in which uh, the mind can operate. Distracted state, a dull state, yeah, um, uh, a state in which concentration is not possible at all. And then uh, it comes to the state of one-pointedness, concentration on one, on one point. And, and this uh, is uh, regarded as uh, the first content of consciousness what can be classified as yoga proper. And the final aim is then um, to uh, let all content of consciousness cease, which then uh, leads to the self-perception of the purusha, the self-perception of consciousness as being pure consciousness. And yoga teaches a lot of uh, different kinds of meditation that may lead to this aim. Yeah, so there is a, a meditation uh, which focuses on the subject itself, yeah, tries to get an uh, ever clearer view of what the subject is, and uh, in this way reduces all the content uh, part of consciousness until it comes to the self-perception of the consciousness. Then there are theological um, meditations in which Ishvara, God, is, t is seen as a model of a liberated self. And uh, the yogi concentrates on Ishvara, reduces it from its mythological content, and gets ever clearer to um, the view this, that his own subject is identical with the Purusha. And in this way, the, the two pictures of uh, the own subject of the yogi and uh, the idea of Ishvara uh, as an object of meditation, they mingle until they finally then also lead to a self-perception of consciousness. There's also a third way, a uh, third structure of meditation in which the things of the outside world can be chosen as an object of meditation and then they are reduced according to the emanation scheme of Sankhya into uh, lower and lower um, contents of consciousness. Yeah? The, the material world is then reduced to the, to the elements, the elements are then uh, reduced to the uh, self-perception, then they come to a stage of pure being and in the end they, they uh, resolve into prakriti, into, into primordial matter, which is beyond any specification by language. And if this takes the place, then only consciousness uh, can shine upon itself and perceive itself. So there are yeah, different ways of meditation, different, uh, different structures of meditation that can be practiced. And, and this takes a, a long time yeah, to, to master these, and uh, therefore training is, is necessary. And all the other practical aspects like uh, breath control, assuming postures, uh, leading a life according to ascetic rules, they have uh, the aim to facilitate this kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another worry that I think someone might have about this is that if it's really true that most of the work, in a way, is done by these meditative practices and so on, then the teaching 
that's offered in a text like the one Patanjali is writing seems like it would have to be very limited. I mean, it sounds like the yogin is achieving this very elevated, difficult to reach point of view on the world. And you even called it mystical a few minutes ago. And that makes me wonder to what extent his privileged perceptions or point of view on the world could really be communicated in a text or for that matter, even in a teacher-student relationship. I mean, isn't, in a way, isn't he just stuck with telling us to try it out and spend 20 years meditating and see if we get there? I think ultimately uh, the final mystical experience cannot be communicated by worlds. And there are um, uh, the attempts uh, to communicate this uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra itself lead to koan-like uh, contradictory formulations. So uh, this is definitely the case. But on the other hand, meditation needs a certain structure. It's necessary for the yogin when he meditates to actually interpret his, his own experience to, to a, a certain preconception. And Sankhya Yoga provides this structure um, for, for the experience that, that the yogi uh, finally has. And uh, the, the teaching of the, uh, of the teacher uh, helps him also to interpret his own experience, not to be lost somewhere on the way. Okay, so the philosophy kind of gives you the initial motivation and explanation of why to do this, and, yeah. but also yeah. structures the procedures. Exactly, what you experience, why you experience this, and uh, where this uh, um, is scaled uh, on the way of, of progress, yeah. Okay, in that case, I guess what I said before, that a lot of people think of yoga as just kind of the practical dimension of Sankhya, in a way that's very misleading, because it sounds like the whole point of this is that yoga is both a theory and a practice, and the two are inextricably bound up with one another. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay. that's the case. Uh, now, we've talked about the relationship between yoga and Sankhya philosophy, which is the most obvious other strand of Indian philosophy to relate this to. But on the other hand, there seem to be parallels or at least resonances with other philosophical traditions within the Indian context. For example, uh, Pantanjali says that the yogi has to be a member of the Brahman class, which it makes it sound like he needs to be someone who's educated in the Vedas. Uh, and from what you've said so far, it's not clear to me why that should be the case. Yep. Um, another example is that uh, there's this instruction to give up on desire in order to achieve liberation, which reminds us very forcefully of Buddhism. Absolutely. Um, should we therefore think that what Patanjali is doing is presenting us with a kind of eclectic mix of ideas from Vedic tradition, from Samkhya, or maybe earlier yogic ideas, and also Buddhism? I don't think that it's uh, an eclectic mix. I think it's the conscious attempt to uh, construct um, a new philosophy and a new religion which opens up uh, the scope for uh, escape from suffering, from, from, uh, for liberation from the circle of rebirth uh, within a Brahmanical context which has not been there previously. If we look at the uh, religious and intellectual history of South Asia, we can see two different, um, two different cultures, more or less to say. On the one hand, the Brahmanical uh, religion, which is very much focused on ritualism, uh, with its own worldview, with its own uh, idea of uh, ritualist causation. And on the other hand, we have a different realm, a different culture, uh, which can be located uh, in the eastern part of the Ganges, Ganges uh, Basin, the region in which Buddhism, Jainism, Ajivikism and other religions uh, originated from the 5th century before uh, the Common Era. And these religions, the so-called Shramana religions, they share a certain worldview. They see the world as suffering. They believe in a circle of, of re uh, rebirth. They believe in karma, uh, things that are foreign to the Brahmanical uh, tradition. And um, due to political circumstances, the religions from uh, the Eastern Ganges Basin, which are, uh, according to Johannes Brankost, called the religions of Greater Bagada, they gained political uh, uh, predominance and founded the first pan-Indian empire, uh, the Maurya Empire, 
um, which propagated uh, these uh, Shramana uh, ideals. So this is King Ashoka. Yeah. This is King Ashoka. The, the, Ab- his, absolutely. The dynasty yeah. that he absolutely. Part of. Yeah. Later, uh, Brahmanical uh, religions managed to become dominant in the political field again. This is something that we see in, in the second uh, century and more clearly in the third or fourth century when the Gupta Empire established the second pan-Indian uh, empire. And the Guptas, they were very much dedicated to the Brahmanical religion. The Brahmanical religion that at this time had been exposed to the influence of the Shramana movements for a very long time. And in some way, the Brahmanas had to react on this. And there were different approaches and different reactions. And one of the possibilities, of course, is to to accept the worldview of the Shramanas and to integrate it into the Brahmanical frame. And this is what Patanjali tried. And this is the reason why we have this very close similarity uh, to Buddhism, because all he could draw upon were um, Buddhist uh, uh, theories of meditation. So we, we see that a lot of the terminology that we find in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra is clearly of a Buddhist coinage. Okay. And the good reason for that is that Buddhist uh, ideas and terminology have sort of spread throughout intellectual culture by this period. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, now let's go way forward to now. Because then I, I realize what I'm about to ask you is a difficult question to answer, probably, but I still feel like I have to ask it. What we've been talking about sounds very philosophically advanced, very nuanced, also very tightly connected with a lot of historical developments in ancient India. And that makes me wonder what, if anything, this could possibly have to do with yoga in the way that most people probably think of it now, which is roughly people going along to gym class with a mat under their arm to stretch and do exercises, maybe meditation too. So we have mentioned meditation. So that's clearly a link. But I'm just wondering, you know, is, is the practice of yoga as we find it, say, in the United States nowadays or Western Europe, it has, does this have anything to do with ancient yoga or an ancient text like the Patanjali's Yoga Shastra? It has something to do in so far as it is the final result of a long historical development. So um, the history of yoga, of, uh, of yoga is the history of transformation. Yeah? This is ex- exactly the case. Yoga has been um, uh, practiced in a Buddhist context. It has then been transferred into a Brahmanical context. And on the Brahmanical side, there have been uh, further transformations. Um, it has been adopted uh, in um, the uh, religion and the theory philosophy of Advaita Vedanta in tantric circles and then later the development into Hatha Yoga. Ascetic movements have adopted yoga practice. They have adopted uh, uh, different kinds of, of yogic postures, breath control. All these things that we find in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra uh, have been eclectically taken over into different se- uh, systems. But what remained is that the Patanjali Yoga was the object of identifying the beginning of the whole thing. So the people say that uh, all these, all the teaching have originally been taught by, by Patanjali. And this continues to the present day. If one goes to a yoga class, the yoga teacher will tell you this comes from Patanjali. Unaware of the many historical developments that have been taking place. Yeah? So it's definitely wrong to claim that what is happening in modern yoga is unchanged, the same thing that Patanjali is th- uh, taught. But uh, yeah, Patanjali still plays a role yeah, as the founding father of the whole tradition. Yeah. So. Okay, well, a very nice example of the way that continuity works in the history of philosophy and maybe just the uh, continuity of human culture more generally, transformation yeah. and stability coming together. Um, thanks very much to Philip Maas for coming on the podcast again. It was a pleasure to talk Thank about you. yoga. And please join Jonardin and me next time as we continue to look at the history of philosophy in India. Allah.